Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar. My name is Janet Griffin, and I am the Director of Alumni Relations. On behalf of the NYU Myers Alumni Association, I want to thank you for joining us today for this program. It is the first event in our new faculty lecture series that will showcase research taking place at NYU Myers. The NYU Myers Alumni Association represents nearly 16,000 alumni from all over the world. On average, we host nearly 20 events annually to connect you with your alumni community and with NYU. In light of the current global health crisis, we have moved our programming online and we are so glad that you are joining us for tonight. Our speaker today is Susan Malone, who is an assistant professor at NYU Myers. Her research focuses on bridging research in behavioral, biological, and environmental rhythms to chronotherapeutic interventions that mitigate type 2 diabetes risk and improve overall health. Her overarching goal is to promote health and prevent cardiometabolic disease across the lifespan. If you have questions during the session, please enter them into the Q&A box on your screen. We will get to as many questions as we can at the conclusion of the program. And if we can, we'll even insert them into uh, the program uh, during the presentation. I'm going to turn the program over to Professor Malone and we look forward to hearing more about your research. Hey, thank you, Janet. And thank to all of you for, for joining. Um, so I'd like to begin with a true story. In 2007, a working mother and the founder of a young startup prioritized her life by you know, making phone calls, sending emails, and just a really long daily task list that you can imagine would be typical for the life of any rising star. And then one day, she woke up in a pool of blood with her cheekbone fractured and her daughter standing over her because she had fainted from exhaustion. Today, Ariana Huffington speaks out to millions of sleep deprived people, encouraging them to find productivity, um, inspiration, and even joy through literally sleeping their way to the top. And she debunks the myth of sleep deprivation, one man upmanship. And I think you all know the bravado. I even find myself using it sometimes. You know, I only slept four hours because I was up all night preparing a lecture or writing a grant. And, and you have your own bravado stories that I'm sure you share with others or perhaps you hear from others. And as you can see here, sleep is making headline news. A decade ago, People wanted to know the answer to the elusive question of why do we sleep? What's its purpose? But today, people are really yearning for answers to a different question. Why don't we sleep? And in this session, what I want to do is share with you um, some evidence about how important living in sync with your body clock is for optimal sleep as well as for overall health and well being. So I'd like to begin with some background information about the circadian system. system. And I'm gonna focus specifically on sleep-wake patterns because these patterns are the most profound behavioral output of the circadian system. And then I'll share with you some of our findings um, related to sleep and cardiometabolic health and let you know what we're currently working on um, in terms of some ongoing sleep intervention studies and maybe even get some interest um, in case you yourself are interested in participating in research. So we'll begin at the beginning. There have been over a trillion dawns and dusks since the beginning of time. And during that time, Earth's rotation slowed to about 24 hours. And this predictable cycle results in profound environmental changes you know, the differences between the light and the dark, the hot and the cold, even food availability. And we know that anticipating these predictable changes gives species a survival advantage. And one example that I like to use is that of coral reef fish. Um, these coral reef fish have specific, their, their eyes actually switch from a night vision to a day vision about 20 to 30 minutes before daytime arrives. And because of this, they're able to um, see food 
as it becomes available and able to avoid predators. So you can imagine that if the alternative existed and their vision did not switch from night to day vision until day was actually there, they would be missing out on feeding opportunities and even perhaps being more vulnerable um, to predators that might be there. So all human life has adapted in some way um, to find a way to internalize the time of day to get this survival advantage. In humans, the primary way for internalizing the time of day is from the light dark signal that enters the eye that you can see over here. And these light dark signals are carried back to a specific group of neurons near the pineal gland. And we call this, these group, this group of neurons the master clock, if you will. And this master clock actually tells the entire body, whether it is day or night, by triggering the release of specific neuronal and hormonal messages that then go throughout the body and um, prepare the body for functions like feeding or fasting or sleeping or waking. And when all goes well, all of these clocks, the master clock and all of these peripheral clocks that you see down here in the lung, stomach, kidney, and liver, they all tell the same time of day. They're all in sync. So you can see here the optimal times of day for specific behaviors. Um, up here at the top of the clock, you can see that melatonin is released in the evening. And it prepares the body for sleep by promoting um, blood vessel dilation and a drop in the core body temperature. And then as we go around and morning arrives, melatonin is no longer released and cortisol is released to prepare the body for waking. It increases the heart rate, it increases blood pressure, preparing the body for activity. And the morning is also a time when all the cells in the body are more sensitive to insulin. So it's an optimal time for energy utilization, um, making eating earlier in the morning or the day rather optimal. And then as we progress over here um, towards the evening, you can see that our bodies are best prepared for physical activity. And this process gets repeated over and over again, suggesting the importance of regularity. But there are several things that actually influence this master clock. And we can refer to them as things that actually influence your chronotype, okay? Um, you can think of chronotype as a behavioral manifestation of this circadian system, or more specifically, our tendency or pre preference to be awake or asleep during certain times of the day. And I know you're probably all familiar with these terms. At the extreme ends of the chronotype, we have people that we can think of as larks, your early to bed, early to rise people. And at the other end of this spectrum, we have the owls or the late to bed, late to rise people. And most of us really fall somewhere in between those two extremes. We know there are specific factors that can actually influence one's chronotype, okay? Um, and there you can see them here in the red box. Three of these four factors, we can't change, we can't modify them. Um, of course, genetics, um, there are specific genes that have, that have been identified for larks as well as owls. Um, gender is also associated with um, chronotype a bit, and females tend to be more lark-oriented than males. And then you're probably more familiar with the effect of age on chronotype. And you can probably recall that when you were children, or if you have children, you know that they're more lark-oriented. Their sleep-wake preferences are for earlier in the day. And then as they progress towards adolescence, this all shifts and they become more owl-like. And actually, um, adolescents uh, reach a peak in owlness around the age of 21. And what's really fascinating about this is it's not just humans. All species actually exhibit this same shift in chronotype 
Loch Ness, when they're young and children, progressing through adolescence to this, the most extreme owl-like behavior that they'll have over the course of their life. And then after the age of 21, we actually start shifting back again towards that more um, lark-like behavior. Oops. So um, the, while well, these three factors that I mentioned, genetics, gender, and age, can't be modified, the fourth factor that you see here, the environment, that may indeed be modifiable. And the environment has a profound effect, not only on our chronotype, but also on the circadian system itself. In particular, our exposure to light and dark rhythms have changed drastically since the Industrial Revolution and specifically since the invention of the light bulb. And as a result, people can now work long hours at night and in dark places. So indeed, you can see here on this slide, our contemporary lifestyles depicted on the left. We spend more time inside during the day, so we get less exposure to that bright sunlight, that 120,000 lux that the sun produces. Um, even if we're sitting near a window, we're only getting about 1,000 lux of light. And if we're in the middle of a room, we're getting about 50 during the daytime, 50 lux. So we're spending more time indoors during the day and we're spending more time on screens at night. And this is increasing our overall light at night exposure, but particularly our exposure to blue light, which is this short wavelength that we know the circadian system is particularly responsive to. And while we have these changes in our contemporary lifestyle that have been brought about by the Industrial Revolution and the light bulb, you can see on the right-hand side of the screen the effect that this is having at a much broader scale. We kind of call this ambient light at night. And you can see this um, in this picture from outer space that North America is truly lit up at night. Um, To drive this point home just a little bit further, you can see on the left a picture um, from space of India in 1994. And only 15 years later, 2020, or 2010 rather, you can see the changes in the light at night exposure um, that exists in India. So as a result of all of these environmental changes, our body clocks have to respond to a much weaker light dark signal than ever before. Um, working indoors again all day, we get very little exposure to the amount of light that is important for circadian systems, if you will, during the day. And then at night, we're just spending way too much time on screens, as well as just being um, very limited in our exposure to truly dark skies at night. And this graph here illustrates the distribution of chronotype um, in a population of adults. And you can see, I'm trying to get my cursor up there. Um, here you can see in the middle, most people fall in between both the larks and the owls. Um, but clearly some people are larks. And what you can see here is that maybe even a bit more people report being owls, okay? And a, an important change has happened in the past two decades. The proportion of people reporting um, this more owl-like behavior, this late to bed, late to rise behavior, has actually been increasing at the population level. And as we mentioned before, this is probably most likely being driven by these environmental changes, um, this exposure to limited light during the daytime, and too much screen time at night and lack of exposure to dark skies. In fact, in the mid-2000s, um, about 2015, um, a group of researchers sought to try to understand the impact of our contemporary lifestyles that you see depicted here on the left with a more natural um, Kind of lifestyle over here on the right. They actually took them camping in the Rocky Mountains to figure out um, 
what difference this made. And what they were interested in comparing was their sleep-wake behaviors under these two very different environmental conditions, as well as um, differences in the um, sleep-promoting hormone melatonin under these two very different conditions. And what they found was that things are very different biologically and behaviorally in these two scenarios. So I'm gonna share with you a graph and if you just bear with me, I, I will walk you through it because I, I think it tells a very interesting story. Um, this again is from the campaign experiment that I described earlier. And you can see up here, um, you have sunset as this first dark vertical line and sunrise as this other dark vertical line. And these thick bars that you see represent the mean sleep periods for people. The top one under electrical lighting conditions and the bottom one under those that natural light, the camping conditions. And there are really kind of two takeaway messages from this. If you look at the electrical lighting, you can see the black triangle, the red square, and the blue triangle representing melatonin onset and melatonin offset. And you can see that they're no longer associated with sunset or sunrise. And you can also see that people are actually waking up from sleep when melatonin is still coursing through their bodies. So what this kind of feels like for people is that because there's such a delay in melatonin um, onset over here, it's kind of hard to fall asleep at night. And then over here at the other end, when they wake up, because that sleep promoting hormone is still coursing through their bodies, they feel really groggy in the morning. Okay, so again, these are the data from those, that group of people under their electrical lighting conditions. And it's much different down here. Again, the same people, but under natural lighting or camping conditions, you can see that melatonin is now perfectly aligned with sunset. And melatonin stops just a little bit after sunrise. And most importantly, melatonin is pretty much out of the system before people awaken. So this type of um, scenario that you see here actually represents um, a type of circadian disruption. The biological rhythms of melatonin are no longer in sync with the environmental sunset and sunrise, nor are the melatonin rhythms in sync with the, our sleep-wake behaviors under electrical lighting conditions. Okay, so more and more we are living out of sync with our body clocks. And you can see here that the impact of living out of sync with these body clocks or having this type of circadian disruption is associated with a whole slew of disorders ranging from cancer and obesity to depression and heart attacks um, and addictions. So our research team's overall goal here at Myers is to develop chronobehavioral interventions that are gonna reduce the risk of type two diabetes as well as improve overall health. And I know you all know these guidelines that we have up here. Sleep seven to eight hours a night, get 150 minutes of physical activity a week and eat at least five fruits and vegetables per day. And while these guidelines are focused on duration and quantity and they are important, they don't really consider the time of day or the regularity of these behaviors. And we think that maybe if we add this piece to these guidelines, that maybe these guidelines might even be more effective in terms of improving health and well being. So I'm going to shift now and I'm going to share with you findings from our work that have given us clues as to why we think we'd like to pursue this further. So before returning to school for my PhD, I worked as a school nurse during the day and as a diabetes educator in the evening. And um, some sleep research at this time was beginning to suggest the importance of getting seven to eight hours of sleep 
for glycemic control. So I always used to tell people in class that the people who sleep the least weigh the most to kind of drive that point home. And then, um, again, this is the early 2000s, and you can recall the obesity epidemic in, in youth was raging, and our high school was no exception. So I began to wonder whether maybe um, the fact that adolescents weren't getting enough sleep might also be somehow kind of connected to um, this obesity epidemic. Um, and I should tell you, not only was I the school nurse, so I'd hear complaints from the teachers, um, I also taught 7.30 a.m. health class, so I actually had them falling asleep in my class. Um, so this is what I went back to get my PhD. This is what I was going to focus. But as I was enrolled in the PhD program, it became obvious that there was a more interesting question. And that question was, why aren't all short sleepers obese? So we began thinking about sleep behavior more comprehensively and suspected that maybe some of these other dimensions of sleep might also be important for metabolic health. And we were especially interested in sleep timing and sleep regularity. We hypothesized that adolescents with later sleep timing, those more owl-like adolescents, um, and also adolescents with more irregular sleep behaviors might indeed have a greater likelihood of being overweight or obese. And we tested this hypothesis in about 100 ninth and 10th grade students. And we found that those owl-like um, chronotypes um, actually had poor dietary habits. They drank more soda and they were more physically inactive. So you can see here the beginnings perhaps of obesity risk behaviors being greater in the owls than in the larks. And we also found that um, adolescents who had more irregular sleep-wake patterns were more likely to be obese. So um, a way to kind of think about this irregular sleep pattern that's typical, not only really of adolescents, but of, of many adults and even children younger than that, um, a way to think about it is with this term that we call social jet lag. Because it's, we call it social jet lag because it's similar to living on the East Coast during the week, kind of going to bed at 10 p.m. and waking up at 6 a.m. And then on the weekends, flying to the west coast even though you don't really fly flying to the west coast because you shift your sleep wake time so much and maybe go to bed more like 1 a.m and wake up at 11 a.m and then you fly back east on monday and you do this every single week over and over again so this type this chronic type of shifting your sleep wake patterns between the weekday and the weekends is termed social jet lag and it's really a type of circadian disruption. Um, so you can, you can see in the image here on the back wall, you can see the clock, which we can call the social clock, and it looks like it's just a little bit after 10. Yet here in this little Lego man, the person, their master clock, their own body clock says it's 520. So even though according to the social clock, they should be getting ready to bed. They really, really don't feel like they're ready to bed for bed because it's only about 520. So the bottom line is that our findings in adolescence showed that later sleep times were linked to more obesity risk behaviors and more irregular sleep-wake patterns were actually linked to obesity. And this is important because obesity is an underlying um, factor behind insulin resistance. And we wanted to test this a little bit more in a large nationally representative US um, database to see if we could have similar findings. And indeed, we kind of did. We found that later bedtimes, so again, the timing issue, later bedtimes were weakly correlated with poor diets and less physical activity, as well as with poor glycemic outcomes, higher hemoglobin A1Cs in people who had diabetes, as well as greater insulin resistance in those who didn't have diabetes. 
So again, this is interesting to us because both the timing and the regularity of sleep are potentially modifiable. In other words, if we can improve these dimensions of sleep, if we can get people to sleep a little bit earlier and to have more regular sleep patterns, then maybe we can um, reduce some of the risks for type 2 diabetes as well as obesity. And so we currently have two NIH funded studies, again, that we're actively recruiting participants for. And the first study that I'll talk about just again very briefly is funded through our P20 Center for Precision Health in Diverse Populations. And the primary aim of this study is to determine the acceptability and feasibility of a well-validated sleep intervention that's used for people who have insomnia in a different group of people. We're looking um, to see the effectiveness of this intervention in people who don't have insomnia, but they're short sleepers. They report sleeping less than seven hours per night on average. And they're middle age, and they have some of these um, chronic health conditions that you see listed here that characterize the metabolic syndrome. And we're particularly interested in whether or not we can improve sleep timing and regularity and if we improve sleep timing and regularity, is that also going to improve some of those metabolic syndrome risk behaviors like poor diets and physical inactivity? The second NIH funded study that we have right now is again looking at that same sleep intervention that's well validated and well tested in people who have insomnia. Again, testing it in people who don't have insomnia but are short sleepers and have pre-diabetes. And we're going to have them not only wear um, a monitor to track their sleep-wake behaviors, as we did in our previous study, but we're also going to um, use continuous glucose monitoring to track their um, glucose levels during this time that they're in the intervention. And what we're looking to see is if we improve these dimensions of sleep, if we improve timing, make it a little earlier, if we make it a little more regular, sleep a little more regular, um, will this improve glucose levels above and beyond standard diet and exercise interventions that we typically see for um, or use for people with prediabetes? So changing the behavior factors, the behavioral factors that contribute to circadian disruption like irregular sleep-wake times, like irregular meal times, like inappropriate light exposure that you see over here in this person on the left. If we improve these behaviors and make them more regular, make them more in sync with the environmental rhythms, Will this contribute to optimal health and well-being? That's something that we're really interested in, in pursuing and finding out more. And we're interested in seeing if we here at Myers, whether our research team um, can actually change the brand for New York City. <laughs> um, take away that New York City is no longer the sleep that never sleeps, but the city that does sleep. So. Um, I'd like to just end here. I'd like, I'm hoping that maybe this has stimulated some thoughts and some questions that I'd be delighted to answer or go into anything a little more depth. Um, but I want to acknowledge our funding sources here. The work that I presented today um, has really only been made possible through our generous funders at NIH, specifically the National Institute of Nursing Research, as well as the Rockefeller University. So um, with that, um, to entertain some questions. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, that was really, really good. Um, makes us all, it's very thought provoking in how we all are handling our daily lives and, um, and our sleep schedules. So we do have a question in the, in the Q&A box. Okay. How does your research direct sleep interventions for those who work the night shift? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, um, what's, what's interesting about um, night shift work is that it's actually increasing, not just here in the United States, but around the world. We're truly becoming a 24 seven um, society. And we really have to find a way to minimize the risk for obesity and cardiometabolic disease um, that these workers are often facing. Um, 
So we have done a secondary analysis using um, some UK biobank data, and we found that whatever, when a night shift worker can get more sleep, their risk for high blood pressure down the road actually decreases. So in the case of night work, night shift work, getting as much sleep as you can, even if it's not during the nighttime, obviously, but during the day is beneficial. Um, there's also a lot of interesting work going on now um, in terms of time-restricted feeding, which maybe you've heard about. And again, this is all related to, you know, the underlying premise for all this is the circadian system. Um, and what they're trying to find out is if they can restrict eating during the night. If night shifters, night shift workers go to work but don't eat, or maybe they don't eat things like carbohydrates that require insulin um, to get moved into the cells, will they have better cardiometabolic health outcomes than night shift workers who actually are eating meals during the night? Um, so, I, I'm thinking that's, oh, the other thing I do want to say about night shift work is not everybody is vulnerable and we're not sure what factors um, make people more resilient or more vulnerable to the deleterious effects of shift work. Um, there's been some interesting research on chronotype, um, largely done out of Germany, and trying to find out are owls, people who report being more owl-like, are they more protected from the deleterious effects, health effects of night shift work? So there's some threads of evidence that suggest that that's so. Um, but again, I, when I think about the issue of chronotype and the owls and the larks, um, we know that this, this distribution has become thicker at the ends, you know, more owls because of electrical lighting. And if we had our more natural setting, you know, we'd have a tighter distribution there. So um, I, I'm afraid I don't have any real easy answers about night shift work, other than it seems to be critically important to get as much sleep as you can. Um, in terms of alertness during night shift work, um, it, this sounds very counterintuitive, but people often, I know when I worked night shift, I was never so sick that you're in my life or so awful feeling. <laughs> I, did the, I worked at Yale New Haven and I had a rotating evening night shift and we knew none of this circadian stuff, right? I just felt miserable. Um, but now we know that um, the opportunity to give people a nap during night shift work seems to be beneficial. And what you should do is if you have the opportunity to take a nap during the night shift, you should actually drink caffeine before the nap. So if you drink the caffeine before the nap, which sounds counterintuitive, when you wake up, you actually prevent that um, groggy feeling that you often have um, after waking up from a nap or waking up in the middle of the night because it will kind of um, counteract the melatonin. Did that answer your question? It was a lot there. Um, Feel free to dig deeper. <laughs> I think you're muted. Maybe. I'm on mute. Uh, <laughs> another question. Please describe the sleep intervention in your studies. Yeah. So thank you. Um, I can't tell you how rewarding it's been uh, for me to do the, this sleep intervention. We have had amazing participants and we don't have this data published yet but it's been an incredibly rewarding ex experience for me and hopefully when we take a look at the data um, I'll still be as excited as I am now just from you know the anecdotal pieces that I have but the sleep intervention that we use is actually based on cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia um, so it's you know, we have our basic sleep hygiene rules, but we really personalize those for the person, depending on what issues are most pertinent for them. And it's very, very behavioral driven. Um, so we talk a lot about this thing called sleep efficiency, which simply said is when you're in bed, how much of that time is actually spent sleeping? And a lot of times people spend a lot of time in bed, but they're not sleeping. So in those situations, we actually shorten their time in bed. We restrict it sometimes often um, to five hours. And when we get the sleep efficiency very high, then we can actually start expanding the sleep opportunity, giving them more time to sleep by moving bedtimes 15 minutes earlier each week. And we do this, um, they, 
they complete sleep diaries every single day for us and we use that data to drive the intervention. And, and the reason we're doing it, um, this very personalized approach is because often people just tell people to sleep longer, right? Just sleep an hour longer, sleep longer, but that doesn't respect the fact that our sleep-wake patterns are driven by, in part, by the circadian system, which takes a long time to adjust. So it's very important to do a gradual shift in terms of sleep extension, okay? So we only move that um, sleep time 15 minutes earlier if the sleep efficiency is high enough. And, um, and again, we're always moving 15 minutes earlier each week so the circadian system has time to adjust. Thank you. Uh, another question, would you please elaborate on the association between sex and chronotype and whether there is any known physiological explanation? Oh, thank you. Um, you know, as far as I know, we don't really understand why it's women tend to be more lark oriented than males. So no, I, I don't have any, um, nothing out there that I'm aware of is giving us a sense physiologically about why females might be more lark oriented than males. Another question that we've gotten, would it would be interesting to conduct some of this research in low and middle income countries where there is no or limited electricity, so more of natural sunrise and sunset rhythm. Have you yes. heard about that? Yes, well, there are many researchers that are actually doing that and they're coming up with um, just phenomenal findings. You know, again, we have this tighter distribution, not so many owls, okay? And people really truly track sunrise and sunset throughout the seasons. So what we find is that, um, you know, even in the summer, um, for us, let's say the summer for us, where our sun rises are earlier and our sunsets are later, we naturally, those people naturally follow that pattern and sleep shorter. And then when they have their darker periods, they still, their sleep-wake behavior still track sunset and sunrise. But again, during what we would consider our winter months or their winter months, their sleep is longer. So there seems to be seasonal variation in terms of sleep duration that maybe we don't always get here because our um, sleep weight patterns are driven by our electrical lights. <laughs> um, there's another um, interesting piece. Um, my all-time favorite conference is the Society for Research on Biological Rhythms, and we only meet every two years. And in that group, that's where many of these researchers are that are looking at sleep-wake patterns in more tribal um, populations in South America. And they found that we've been so sun-centric that we've kind of ignored the moon. And so they're beginning to look at their data a little differently and comparing the tribal data to college students at the University of Washington, um, where the researchers are, um, that's kind of their home. And they actually find that the moon also has an influence on our sleep-wake patterns. So not only do we see seasonal variation where during summer months we sleep shorter and winter months we sleep longer, we also see monthly variations. And as the moon um, gets larger um, or waxes, um, we find that sleep becomes a little bit shorter. And then as it wanes um, and becomes smaller, sleep is actually elongating, getting a little bit longer. So there's even these subtle variations um, within the month as well as the season. Thank you for that question. All right, we have time for another question. If there's anything else that um, our guests would like to ask, we'll give you another few seconds. But this is, okay. again, this has been great. I wish I had put up a poll really quickly on who is a lark and who is an owl. That's, um, yeah, I feel like that changes throughout your lifetime, as you said, and depending on what age you are, what stage of life you're in. Well, while we're waiting, I can uh, let you know that um, we also um, are running a very interesting body time assay, it's called. It's a new assay because we're always trying to figure out, you know, what is somebody's natural um, chronotype? Um, 
And it's difficult to measure because again, those cells are at the pineal gland in the brain and there's so many environmental factors that influence them. So in the first study that I mentioned, we actually um, tested this assay in about 10 adults. We don't have the results on that yet, but the idea being that if we can align somebody's natural body time, right, and prescribe them um, a kind of a sleep-wake schedule, a meal schedule, a physical activity schedule that fits with that body type, might that optimize um, their, their health and well-being? Yeah. We do have one last question that just came in. Are there specific foods to assist jet lag? Ah, <laughs> yeah, uh, jet lag. Well, interestingly, at this um, Biological Rhythms Conference, the pharmaceutical com um, companies are all over jet lag. <laughs> so I suspect in the near future, there's actually going to be um, something that people can take that can um, make their circadian system adapt a little bit quicker um, to these transmeridian, this transmeridian travel that so many of us pre-COVID um, would enjoy. Um, but in terms of food, um, Food can actually um, be a signal, just like I mentioned, light dark is a signal for the circadian system. Food is also a signal. And the important thing would be that when you get to your new destination, that you get right on their schedule and that you eat breakfast, preferably, you know, if you, I forget which way you'd be traveling, but you really wanna eat soon and on that wake pattern. And they even suggest that eating things like chocolate, which can be particularly rewarding um, at the level of, you know, when you think about endorphins and that type of thing, um, it rewards that part of the brain and stimulates then that interest in waking up um, on the new morning time of your destination place. So chocolate. <laughs> Probably not too many nurses give advice to patients about that. Huh? <laughs> I personally love that answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and another question too that I, I find interesting, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but how dangerous is it when you wake up at 7 a.m. four days and one day at four due to schedule changes? How does this affect your body? Yeah, you know, um, again, we don't know who's vulnerable and who's resilient. But that's a pretty huge shift, the 4 a.m. and the 7 a.m. wake times. What we find um, when, we, when we look at this kind of social jet lag thing where people are delaying wake times often on the weekend, we find that even a one hour later wake time on the weekend is associated with these um, cardiometabolic effects. Um, so when you're talking about a three hour shift every single week, that's huge it would be more optimal to, um, you know, unfortunately if 4 a.m. is a time you have to be up and going for work, if that's something you can't change, it would be more optimal to shift those 7 a.m. wake times earlier and closer to the 4 a.m. Again, about a one hour cutoff seems to be what we see um, associated with poor metabolic health outcomes. All right. Well, again, thank you, Susan, so much for joining us tonight. Um, this was really great. There's been actually several people that have thrown up in the chat. I don't know if you've seen that said, thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, it's my, my it for you before you click out of here. But um, there was one person that did ask if the recording and slides will be available after the session. The answer is yes. I will be emailing everybody that registered um, within the next 24 hours, and I'll include the link for you to access um, the whole presentation. So uh, just be looking for that in your inbox. Um, so again, thank you so much, Susan. You've given us a lot to think about, about our lifestyle that we are leading right now. You know, the kinds of foods that we're eating or not eating and how we can maybe decrease our waistlines just by getting better <laughs> sleep, which is another, you told us to eat chocolate and decrease our, our waistline. So this is all good news. And it's all good news. <laughs> <laughs> all okay. Right. All right. Thank you all so for your questions and for attending. It was really a pleasure. Yeah, thank you everyone for being here tonight and um, hopefully we'll see you again soon on Zoom. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.